Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today is webinar, Trust Under UCC, Article 9, on March 3rd, 2020. At this time, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Dan Lyons, and he's with CT. He is CT's Transactional Business Consultant. Welcome, Dan. Well, thank you, Amanda, and thank you for all who are attending uh, across the United States today. Uh, a few things just off the top here, certainly uh, as far as po questions are concerned, we certainly will do our best to g gather all those questions up as the presentation goes along and we'll uh, do, and do our best to get those answered to you shortly after the presentation. If there's something really, really pressing though during the presentation and you really do want us to um, uh, you know, try to do it here during the presentation, just let uh, the folks know and we'll get it to my get it to me, and, uh, and try, like I said, try to do it in this hour's presentation. A few other things is first and foremost is that if, if you are in a state that's, had, that's voting, for God's sakes, get out there and vote. Uh, regardless of party affiliation, it's all, it's, I think it's a good thing to air our, our ideas through the ballot box, so if you haven't done it yet, please do. And also just a special note for those who may be in the uh, Tennessee area, Nashville area, uh, certainly our thoughts are with you. Uh, the news from Tennessee in terms of the tornado damage and, and unfortunately the 19 lives who have been lost so tragically. Uh, our thoughts are with for those of you in, in that area and if, if anyone who has connections to that area. It's certainly a very tragic bit of news uh, today. But uh, as what we're talking about today is the tantalizing world of UCC and how it connects with trust. Uh, the hour-long presentation or so. Its intent today is to kind of give you a broad overview of some of the things that these two areas are connected to. And so as you can see from our agenda, trust basics, filing, searching, as you, you can't get more basic than that when it comes to both UCC and, and due diligence and trust for that matter. Uh, again, uh, our intent today is just to kind of give you this broad overview and right out of the gate what I would like to tell folks is, you know, and while these slides I hope will communicate this, I think that one of the overarching stories from trusts and UCC is, is that they're not something that we should be overly scared about. I hope that this presentation uh, demonstrates a little bit of that. Uh, it, the, the rules have changed if we, since 2013 in particular, and if we treat them much like we would do, say, a corporation uh, and, and follow those kinds of rules, I think that we'll find that filing UCCs as it pertains to trust is not nearly as daunting and, and as scary as, uh, as it first looks at first blush. That doesn't mean that each state doesn't have some of their own nuances. I, I do not mean to dis, uh, discount that. Particular, some states do have some particular nuances to their trust law. But again, I think the over the if there is one thing that comes through when it comes to trusts and UCCs is that uh, it's not something necessarily to be overly scared about, uh, and I hope that that's communicated today. I would be remiss if I didn't do a quick shout out. I saw a couple of names on there that I know. Uh, you obviously didn't know I was going to say this, but the Wansley Beck down in Oklahoma. Uh, it's been a long time, my friend. I hope things are well. And also Joe Waller up at Measurely and Kramer in Minneapolis. Uh, good to see your name on here as well. So uh, shout out to you guys and, and again, hope all is well. So what are we talking about when we're talking about trust? Well, we, like any presentation, we have to have a foundation and that foundation starts with a definition of trust. You can find your definition pretty much anywhere, but this is the one that we picked for today's presentation. And it's, it's the right enforceable solely by equity in equity to the beneficial enjoyment, as you can see, um, uh, and I won't read it all completely, but some of the highlights here, uh, for a trust to be valid, it must involve specific property, reflect the settler's intent, and be created for a lawful purpose. I think, again, uh, if you think about this, is that it, those, th those three guiding principles are very simple. And, and because of the simplicity of that, you've also seen a proliferation of trusts um, being made and created here in the United States. Historically, trusts were kind of, you know, if you look at them, were always left to uh, families of privilege, if you want to call it that for a better term. 
you know, the Carnegie Trust or the Vanderbilt Trust or something of that nature. And obviously I'm dating myself with those names, but, uh, you know, certainly that's sort of the, when people think of trust, that's what they think of. Well, that's no longer the case. As you can see from the basic, the foundation of trust, trust can be created for anything. And because of that kind of flexibility that we see in trust, you really have seen a proliferation of trust being formed by a wide range and wide swath of, of entities and individuals. And so this, the issue of trusts and how they relate to UCCs is growing, not shrinking. More questions come in on trusts uh, every year from the year before. And, and so this is something that is, is, if you want to say there's a growth market in UCCs, trusts and UCCs is one of those growth markets. Right. So that's what a trust is, and that's how it can, you know, and, and certainly, like I said, there's other definitions out there. Cast the characters. This doesn't change. This is pretty universal across all the states. There might be some nuances and some other definitions, but these are our folks that kind of work in the, you know, that make the, the, the row the boat when it comes to trust. You have the trustee, that's the party that has the legal control over the trust. The grantor, that's the person that is establishing or entity that's establishing the trust. The estate, which is the property of the trust. And the beneficiary, so the person who's receiving the benefit from the trust. And so to use the, the most ex easy example would be if, if you have a family trust that's set up by the grandparents, uh, administered by, for the, for the, uh, for the grandchildren, administered by one of their kids, the trustee, uh, would be the, one of the main kids, right, of the, of the grandparents. The grantor, the grandparents, the beneficiary is the grandkids themselves, and the estate is whatever the grand, the grandparents put into the trust. So that could be land, it could be money, it could be stocks, it could be bonds. Again, as long as it has a legal purpose and all that jazz, that, that trust would be would be good to go, and, and again, like I said, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, so again, pretty straight, we, as we can say over and over again, the, the law around trusts or its formation and its structure is pretty simple. Now what you do with them can be as complex as you want, and this presentation isn't going to be getting into all the kind of complexities and all the different types of trusts and the legality around all those trusts. That would be several different presentations to regard talking about those. Uh, this is really more re relegated, if you will, to how trusts relate to the UCC and, and how best to function with them. But as you can imagine, there is a ton of trusts uh, when it comes to uh, out there. And as you can see from this slide, as we, as we already kind of somewhat des described it here, you, you move the money into the pot, uh, the trustee manages it, grows it, uh, sends the money out to the beneficiaries, whatever, whoever they may be. So it is a very straightforward setup for a trust. Uh, the, the basic machinery of it uh, doesn't really vary uh, from state to state or jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, and so, again, nothing to be overly uh, scared about, if you want to use that word, or concerned about when you're talking about trust. They are a very simple uh, document at, at its base. Now, what, like I said, what you do with it and all the other things that you add on to it, that's a different matter. So what are the duties of this trustee? As you can imagine, the trustee carries a significant amount of power because they are the ones charged with managing the overall health of the trust. And again, this set, set of duties are fairly standard across the country, but again, each state may have a different definition, and common law may have a different definition as well. But as we can see, I think the, the word, the, the phrase that usually comes around trust is the first one, good faith. Every trustee is responsible to, to exercise their good faith when it comes to the assets of the trust. Pretty much that's, uh, that is also fairly universal. Uh, competence, candor, honesty, loyalty. Sounds like we're talking about a, a Labrador retriever. But the reality of it is, is that those are the qualities that a trust is supposed to demonstrate. They are loyal to the trust. They're looking out for the trust. They, they, have, they have to be honest and forthright with the beneficiaries of the trust. There's certain responsibilities in terms of annual reports that they have to fill out. All that is part of the duties of the trustee, and they are a fiduciary duty. It is a very high duty. This is just not your average, ordinary, 
run-of-the-mill, reasonably prudent person duty. This is a fiduciary duty. It carries with it a lot of responsibilities and that you just don't have in a standard, uh, straightforward relationship. So but like I said, the biggest takeaway from this is good faith. You have to exercise your good faith, your prudence, if you will. Characteristics of the trust. Here we have, we have empty trust, trans transfer of assets, authorization, trust document, again, making it so it's an organic document, very similar to our uh, uh, corporate documents like an LLC or an Inc. But uh, the trust always starts out being empty. Then you have a duty to transfer the assets in the trust. You then have the authorization to activate the trust, so to speak, under the, under, under the underlying agreement. And then the, and all that's being managed and controlled by that document, which is, uh, again, the, the trust document, trust agreement, which, again, can take many different forms. Uh, and, again, uh, uh, each state also has some of their own particular issues. Massachusetts, for example, has a set of trusts that are quite well known in Massachusetts, but we won't be getting into that conversation here. Which gets us to our polling question number one. Perfect. So polling question number one, please remember to cast your vote so that you can get your CLE credit. Please do this on your screen that has a pop-up. Please do not do it in the Q&A box. First polling question, the person or entity that manages or controls the trust is called the grantor, the beneficiary, the trustee, or the coordinator. Again, polling question one, the person or entity that manages or controls the trust is called the grantor, the beneficiary, the trustee, or the coordinator. Please make sure that you do answer these questions within the pop-up that has appeared on your screen. We'll give you just a few moments, and then we'll go ahead and push out the polling results so Dan can speak to them. Again, the person or entity that manages or controls the trust is called the grantor, the beneficiary, the trustee, or the coordinator. Okay, it looks like we've got everyone's votes. We'll go ahead and push out the poll results. And Dan, you should be able to see those results. Yep, we almost perfect score. Absolutely, trustee is the is the individual who is the individual or entity who manages and controls the uh, trust assets and things of that nature. So. That you're absolutely right. That's a very good statistic. I mean, you're, that's almost perfect. So I appreciate that, and, and uh, shows that we're obviously that I'm not doing that bad of a job in terms of explaining that role and responsibility. So yes, it is the trustee, and you know the trustee can be any any entity or individual. So uh, that's why you see certainly trust uh, banks historically having trust departments. Individuals can be trust. Almost anyone can be a trust. All right. Uh, out there, uh, and so uh, and they and they certainly have proliferated uh, along the same lines as the number of trusts that have grown uh, in this country. So that only question number one. Now we're going to be turning our attention to filing UCCs as they pertain to trusts. Right. As we can, uh, you know, one of the, the questions that now where we combine UCC law with trusts, the, the million dollar question is who is the debtor? And under, that's where we start getting into the code section pertaining to the UCC. And we have our defi handy dandy definition of debtor here in 9102.28. Person having an interest other than a security interest or other lien. So you can see a seller of accounts, chattel paper, uh, intangibles, or promissory notes, or a cosine. Co co so as you can imagine, the definition of debtor under UCC is incredibly broad. Uh, it was meant to be broad to encapsulate as much flexibility into the system as possible because you don't want to start pigeonholing who could or could not be a debtor uh, that would limit the breadth and scope of revised Article 9. So the definition of debtor is quite broad. So when we have this question as it rubs up into, bumps up or rubs into the issue of a trust, the question is, is well, who is, the, who is the debtor when you're filing it regarding UCC? And is the trust the debtor? And again, the answer is yes, it is. Uh, trust is a separate legal entity, a legal entity, 
it generally holds legal title, and you file in the location where the trust exists. So the trust, again, this is where we get into that discussion about what is a trust like. Uh, again, the tr trust is like a corporation in a lot of ways when you view it as an entity. It has its own rights, responsibilities, duties, and therefore your UCC must work with that definition so that you properly uh, uh, support yourself with your priority and your notice requirements and all that pertaining to revise Article 9. So again, with a debtor and trust, the trust can be, and in most cases is, uh, the debtor under a UCC. It also can be a secured party. So that certainly is true too. But certainly a, they can be uh, a debtor under revised Article 9. There's no question about that. Uh, trustee, can they be the debtor? Sure they can. All right. Now the question that you always have to ask and answer yourself when it comes to that is, is that in what capacity is the trustee acting? Uh, and that's a question you know, that, we, that may in, in fact be almost its own presentation in and of itself. But a trustee, they have their responsibilities under the trust, and they also have their trust responsibilities as someone outside of the trust. Uh, now, if they are acting on behalf of the trust, do you need to file a UCC against the trustee if they truly are act, acting as a member of the trust? Well, the vast majority, the vast majority of case law and code sections would point to the fact that you don't have to do that. That again, the trust is its own separate entity. It has its own responsibilities. The trustee is acting on behalf of the trust. The trust is the true debtor, not the trustee. And so therefore, you don't have to file a UCC against the trustee since they are acting on behalf of the trust. But this is where you do see a little bit of that fraying of and the uncertainty around trust law. Uh, and what you do see people do, and again, we can't, the, 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 certainly the Secretary of State's offices are going to take this, you will see folks out there who will file against both the trust and the trustee as a somewhat of a belts and suspenders rule. Again, the state's going to take the filing. They're never going to say no to it. It's a piece of paper. They're going to charge you for it. You're certainly fine to do that. But normally in a scenario like that, when it comes to the question, you always have to ask yourself right out of the gate, in what capacity is the trustee doing work? And if the trustee is truly doing something on behalf of the trust, then again, the code is pretty straightforward. The trust is really who you file against. The trustee is not necessarily an active player. Now, if the trustee is doing something separate, distinct, in some other capacity, that's an entirely different ball of wax that you may need to file something on that. But, uh, but in the general sense, the answer is if they are acting on behalf of the trust for the trust's benefit, all the things that we've laid out in the earlier slides, you really only need to file the UCC against the trust and not the trustee. Who is a debtor? A trustee is a debtor and is not a registered organization. Now, again, we start getting into some of these separate, separate and dis, uh, rules. Trusts can be registered. No question about it. Every state in the union allows for a trust to be registered, just like you do a corporation or an LLC or anything of that nature. There's no state out there that says you can't register a trust. Right? Now, do, do most trusts get registered? Absolutely not. The vast majority, not even close, uh, trusts don't get registered. They don't go through that, that system like you see an LLC or uh, a, an incorporation or something like that. There's a multitude of reasons of why that's done that way. Uh, the, the majority of that is connected to tax reasons and some other related legal reasons. Again, not getting into the specificity on this presentation, but the vast majority of trusts never get into the same uh, driving lane, if you will, as a corporation or a uh, LLC. But they can be. Every, you know, there's no, there are, every, like I said, every state in the union does allow for state, for trust to be filed and registered and then treated uh, as a true entity um, uh, under the law. But the vast majority don't. So that's why we have this slide. If, if the trustee is a debtor and it is not a registered organization, uh, uh, well, this is actually where the trustee is not a registered organization, such as like a bank, it's just an individual. Uh, they, they may still hold legal title, and you still file in the location of the trust. I apologize about that for 
the clarity there. I got on my soapbox and I lost track of what I was talking about. But, the, but here in this is a situation where the trust is just an individual, like you, me, or somebody else. You file in the location of the trust. No. Dead or name. All right. Again, we're going to follow the code here, and the code trumps, uh, no, pun, no pun intended, the, tro the code trumps anything that trust law has as it pertains to what you're filing on the UCC. Again, we have 9503. A uh, financing statement sufficiently provides the name of the debtor. It's a collateral, as you can see. Here we go, under A and B. Uh, is the organic record of the trust specifies the name of the trust, the name specified, or the organic record of the trust does not specify the name of the trust and the name of the settlor or testator and so forth. What are we saying here is pretty, it's actually really, really straightforward, as I've already somewhat indicated. If it is a registered trust, you use the name that they registered it under, right? If it's not a registered trust, let's just say they didn't take that extra step, but the trust is still named. It is the uh, Dan Lias Living Trust, right? Even though it's not registered, but it is named, that's the name of the debtor for on the trust, uh, or for the UCC. That's the name you use on your UCC-1. Only in scenarios where the trust is not named, it, and for lack of a better term, it just says the trust. That's it. In those rare exceptions, then you need, you'd use the name of the settlor or the testator of the trust. So going back to our example, if the grandparents create a trust and they don't name it, it's just the trust, then on the UCC filing, you would name the grandparents as the, uh, as the debtor. Uh, but if they had named the trust, the Dan Lyons Family Trust or something along those lines, then that trust name is the name that you use. Right? Now, one of the nuances that we have since 2013 is, is that if you are filing on trust, you have to indicate on your filing that it is a trust. Right? The other thing that you want to make sure of, too, is, is that if there is a series of trusts, say the using that same grandparent example, say they set up a bunch of trusts that are separate for each of their grandchildren, you have to make sure that you are identifying what particular trust that you're dealing with. So they have six grandchildren. You have to make sure that on your UCC that you are indicating with specificity which of those six that you're dealing with. That is a wrinkle under the code uh, as it pertains to trust. That's something that you don't see uh, spelled out anywhere else when it comes to corporations or LLCs. But as you can imagine, it's pretty, fairly, pretty straightforward. Again, you have to indicate that it's a trust, and, I, and if they do have uh, a series of trusts, you have to make sure that you say that on your filing about which particular trust that you're dealing with. And again, it, 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 that's been a, a change in the law since 2013. All right. Uh, next slide is trust as a registered organization, exact name, organic documents. Again. Uh, if the trust is not a registered organization, you always look for the organic documents. You know, this is somewhat repetitive of the prior slide. But again, it's one of those things that we just want to try to drive home with everyone who's attending. Don't be scared of trust. If you have the trust documents in front of you and they're named, that's the name you use. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, just follow the rules and you will be fine when it comes to that. And I will say that statistically speaking, the number of trusts that are not named constantly is going down, down, down every year. Uh, as trusts have become more sophisticated, as trusts have become more numerous, as trusts have become a, a vehicle that is almost everyone now uses in some way, shape, or form, very seldom do you run across trusts that are just nameless. So ho hopefully for all of us here in attendance, we won't come across too many trusts that have that issue. But if you do, you mean the code does spell out how, how best to handle that. Debtor address, which name to use, or at which, which address to use. There is no special rules under the code that says what address to use. This is probably one of those questions that we get a ton of. You know, what, do we use the trustee's address? Do we do this? Do we do that? You know, what address do we use? Understand that because the code does not give us a, any guidance on that, it is, as you can imagine, then somewhat pretty open to interpretation. 
what you do see people do is they do use the trustee's address if they can, uh, if they feel comfortable with that, or if they know where the assets of the trust, uh, uh, you know, whatever, whatever was put into the trust uh, to be managed. If they know that address, they can use that address. Again, it is very flexible. Uh, you can do care of addresses as well. The code permits that. So the address is not something that you really should get overly hung up on. It, under the code, address is not something that is deemed one of the serious misleading uh, requirements of a UCC filing. Uh, you certainly want to put a, an address up there that adequately reflects what you're talking about. But as we can see here, uh, the, because the code is somewhat silent, or not somewhat, the code is silent on this, you don't, you can have some flexibility when it comes to doing that. So again, what we see a lot of folks doing, again, like I said, using the trustee's address or the address of the, of the asset of the trust. And like I said, as we were saying before, as an indication of collateral, it's right there straight on the UCC1 form. It's under, under Section 5. You have to check that box to make sure that you're talk, that if you, if you know you're doing with a trust, that you check that box and make sure that that is what you're doing. Like I said, pretty straightforward. And as you can see, our example here is where the box is checked. Which gets us to question two. Sorry about that. And pulling question two, can a trust be registered with the state? Let's go ahead and push this out to the attendees. Yes, only in limited expectations, never, or it depends on the jurisdiction. Again, CLA polling question two, can a trust be registered with the state? Yes, only in a limited expectation, never, or it depends on the jurisdiction. We'll go ahead and let that sit there just for a few minutes so that you can go ahead and cast your vote. While that is setting up there, we have had a few people ask for today's presentation. Please note that the presentation is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen under that files icon, so you are able to go ahead and download that, or it's also in the reminder notice that went out this morning. So again, polling question number two, can a trust be registered with, the state, with that state? Yes, only in limited expectations, never, or it depends on the jurisdiction. And it looks like we've almost got everyone's vote here. We'll go ahead and leave it up for just a few more seconds. And we'll go ahead and push out the results to you. And Dan, you should be seeing those answers now. Yep. Thank you so much, Amanda. Yep. Thank you for the answers. We have yes leading the pack with 74.5. Second place, it depends on the jurisdiction with 23.4 never, and then only in limited exceptions? The answer is yes. Uh, number one, uh, is every state in the union does allow you, even our, also our, I should say, our um, places like Guam and so forth as well, also allow for the registration of trust. Now, the vast majority of trusts don't get registered. They don't take that step. But, you, but each state does permit you to register your trust or some type of trust in one way, shape, or another. So thank you so much for listening, and again, that is a great statistic. So let's, moving on, now we have our trust filing scenarios. Okay. Uh, again, now I will say I will preface this next uh, set of slides by saying there is going to be certainly an, an, some repetition when it comes to the upcoming slides, and I do apologize for that. There's a, approximately 16 or 17 variations of UCC trust filings uh, under the code. And some of these slides, as you get into it, you're probably going to be like, well, didn't we already cover that? And the answer is yes and no. There are some small nuances between all 17, but there are some overarching uh, principles that guide them all. So I do apologize if some of this becomes a little bit, uh, well, I don't want to necessarily say boring, but you can start saying like, well, hey, I already know that. Well, bear with us that there is a reason why we have the, the different variations, because there are some uh, each one of these is uniquely cued to a set of facts. So uh, with that in mind, we will be starting our set of trust, uh, trust filing scenarios. 
Scenario number one, debtor is a trust and a registered organization, and the trust has the name, right? Pretty straightforward. UCC1, name of trust, 1C, address of trust, you file where the trust is registered. So the trust is registered in my beloved home state of South Dakota, which, by the way, leading the nation in, in trust formations uh, since they modified their, uh, their trust laws a few years ago. So all roads lead to peer. Uh, but, uh, but again, if it's registered in that particular state, that's where you would be doing your UCC filing with that state. Name of trust on there, address of the trust as it's laid out in the, in the file document. So again, very similar, almost identical to what you would see with a standard UCC filing with a corporation or LLC. Scenario number two, debtor is a trust and organization which is not registered and the trust has a name. Right? Again, trust, debtor is a trust and, but not registered, which I think this example probably fits the vast majority of trusts that we see out there. Uh, on the UCC1, name of trust, 1C, address of the trust, 5, checkbox to indicate that it's a trust, and you would file, file where the trust is located. Place of business, if more than one place of business, location of the chief executive office. Again, pretty straightforward when it comes to a UCC. Uh, filing when it comes to a trust. Right? So, and again, uh, uh, this is meant to, to be, uh, when we changed the law in 2013, uh, and we addressed some of these issues of the trust, we meant to kind of demystify that. Now, I will say again, and it just bears repeating throughout all of this, trust laws in each state are, are indeed very uh, unique to every state. Well, not all, but mo there are some unique qualities to some of states' particular trust law. So this does not in any way, shape, or form, when we're going through these slides, uh, meant to, you know, uh, not include those types of unique qualities. I mean, again, I'm just picking on a state. I'm, we're certainly not sitting here and saying there's the unique qualities or uh, requirements of, say, in Arizona, if Arizona has some requirements about their trust. Again, these are not going into those kinds of requirements. Uh, this is just as it applies to UCCs and things of that nature. So I, I do understand that each, some, some states have some unique properties to their trust, or to their, yeah, to their trust. But again, we're just talking as it relates to the UCC. Uh, scenario number three, right? debtor is a trust and registered organization. The set lore is an individual. The trust is without a name. Right? So again, this is just where it's just the trust. So on 1B, as we were talking about before, name of set lore. Uh, 1C, address, of, the address of, of trust. 5, check that box to make sure that you're indicating it's a trust. File where the trust is located. Place of business. If more than one, as you can see, we can start seeing some of this rep repetition already. But again, for the name of the settler, and that's what's so important about this, it's the name of the debtor, I should say, the most important thing here is that you make sure that that's the set law, right? That because that it's an unnamed trust, you have to go back to the, to the creator of that trust and put that person or entity or whoever that is in the box uh, under 1B for the, for the debtor name. And we do have some real life examples. Uh, there's a few that, that have come up over the last few years, and we've incorporated them into our pre trust presentation, and this is the first one. And as you can see, one of the borrowers is the John Doe Revocable Living Trust. The trust established under a declaration of trust, so we have a trust document, which is going to be very controlling in, in all things moving forward. The, trust is, the trustee of this trust is Mrs. Mrs. Doe. Uh, Mrs. Doe, unfortunately, is not legally competent, so documents actually will be signed by her name, by her name, by her son John, who is now holds power of attorney. How do I name the debtor for purposes of the UCC financing statement for filing with the Secretary of State or and or County? Right? And then we have another one. We have another example down below. For for real life question number one, guys, understand that the trust is named. So regardless of whether or not the original trustee is of sound mind or not is actually irrelevant to the, to the filing of the, of the UCC. The trust is named. 
the, tr the trustee is Mrs. John Doe. So if uh, if, the, if the trust is the blah, blah, blah trust, in this case it is the John Doe Revocable Living Trust, that is the name that you're going to be using on your trust, on your UCC filing. It doesn't, um, the, 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 the health and wealth of the trustee, while it impacts the, the mechanism of the trust and how the trust works, on the UCC, uh, it doesn't really impact it, that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Doe um, uh, is no longer competent. Uh, the, again, her, her son will be acting on her behalf, but the, on the UCC, it's been named the John Doe Revocable Trust. That's the name you're using on the UCC. Doesn't change. All right. Uh, real life trust question two. Titles of the real property is actually held by the big city title land trust company as successor trustee to the big bank okay, as a trustee under trust agreement known as trust number 9683. How do I name this debtor for purposes? Again, the trust is trust number 983, which we do see uh, one of the, again, in terms of trust filings, trusts uh, created by banks and having these unique names under, uh, created by the trust is truly, truly uh, uh, something that we've just seen kind of skyrocket over the last few years. One thing I would point out on that too, very quickly, and I'm sorry I, I pivot on stuff like this, but very quickly, one of the things you always have to be concerned about with those kind of trusts that are created by financial institutions and the like is sometimes it, you come up with a character limit issue, uh, especially if it's, a, if it's a, uh, a paperless filing ser service such as New Jersey, Ohio, and the like. You may run up into some character limits if they truly have one of those really, 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 really long names. So that's all something you have to keep in mind when it comes up to trusts created with those really long names, that in some jurisdictions there is the potential of a character limit. And so always keep that in mind uh, when you're dealing, especially like I said, in states where it's, it's paperless. It, is, it does impact. For a while I know that in particular New Jersey was having an issue on that when they rolled out their uh, uh, electronic filing. But the, the important thing here, guys, I, and I apologize for that pivot. I, it's not every day I get out of, the, um, you know, out of my nerd quarters and I get to talk to people, so I apologize. But one of the things here that I think that's very telling, again, to, and similar to the first question here, is it's really regardless, it, it, the, the, the change in the trustee is not an issue here. The trust was named, that's the name you use on the filing. That didn't change. The fact that there's, we've changed partners, so to speak, dance partners underneath the, under, the, under the trust, while again relevant and legal to the trust, um, does not impact um, uh, does not impact that UCC filing. The trust is named. That's the name that you're using. So again, and these are things that we've actually seen come up and be asked by our firms, uh, primarily here in uh, Chicago and across the U.S. So now we're going to scenario number four. Uh, but here we have debtor is a trust, an organization is not registered, the settler is an individual, the trust is without a name. <clears throat> On the UCC, name of settler, address of trust, check the box, file, place of business, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, you're going to see some of this that just keeps uh, uh, running, seeing a lot of similarity that's, that's coming through. Debt, scenario number five. Debtor is a trustee, so now we've changed gears. Now here we have the trustee is the debtor. The trustee is an individual, the trust has a name. UCC1, name a trust, address a trustee, check the box to indicate trustee. File where the trustee is located, trustee's principal residence. Okay. So this does not happen that frequently. This example doesn't happen that, uh, that often at all, but when it does, um, here, this is the steps that you would take to do so. Do so. Now, uh, again, uh, one, one of the things that we do see a lot of, and I don't think we have a slide on this uh, in this presentation, but I do want to point it out quite a bit in terms of things that we do see happen a lot, and these scenarios all fall into the next category, is the following. You do set up the trust, or someone sets up the trust, and it's the uh, Beverly Odom Trust, Family Trust. 
right? And Dan Wyatt is the trustee. Well, what we have, what you do see a lot of, unfortunately, is someone will put on the UCC one, the Beverly Odom Trust, Dan Lyons is trustee. Now, that is not the name of the trust. The trust is the Beverly Odom Trust. But unfortunately, a lot of people do add that tag on thinking that it's important. And the best way I can describe this is like when you see people who will do a corporation, Bev Odom Inc., formerly known as, you know, uh, uh, Bev's Roofing or, you know, or, you know, or, or Bev's Landscaping. All right. And when you do that, just like in a corporation, you go like, oh, well, you can't do that. I mean, that's not the name of the debtor. I mean, you're going to find that seriously misleading. That's going to lead to a, a fine that gets kicked out. You're absolutely right. Same is true with trusts, guys. You can't add that Dan Lias as trustee onto that filing and think that that's the name of the trust because it's not. And you do see that happen very, very, very frequently, unfortunately. The other thing that, that kind of comes up in and around that uh, issue is the, the following comment. Well, I'll just list the trustee somewhere else on the document. Again, you can do that. There's no law that says you can't, can't do that. I would caution, however, this, that we have also seen from our experience uh, uh, from reviewing these UCCs that while the intent of the filer was pretty clear that the trust was named this and the benefit and the trustee was was separated that there's no control over what people will do later on with these trust filings and that there is a temptation to at some point down the road lift that name of that trustee back up into that uh, original name so one of the things which we have seen countless times and we've actually had this question with a few uh, paralegals in particular down in Kansas City a few years ago where that happened uh, on two separate instances uh, within the same week. They've discovered that the trust was named this, and then someone lifted the trustee's name into the filing. Can't do that. Uh, you are going to find yourself, uh, like I said, very similar to a corporation where you've uh, included a DBA or a formerly known as on your filing. You're going to find yourself in a situation where your filing is not, uh, won't stand the scrutiny of the UCC code. So always be uh, cognizant of that. Uh, when it comes to your UCC filing. Which gets us to real life question two. The debtor has a trust with two co-trustees. On filing, debtor's mailing address is both co-trustees' mailing addresses as they appear. The address of one co-trustee is in Indiana, but the other co-trustee co is in Colorado. So for the questions is, does a trust have an address as any entity would have, and where would you file? All right. Now, this is one of those things where, you know, they say do as I, do as I say, don't do as I do type of thing when you're talking with your kids or, or pets or what have you. Uh, but again, we know that under the code, the trust address is somewhat vague, doesn't really control. And so that's, and, but because of that vagueness, it does lead to a level of uncertainty. Uh, what you do see certain folks do in scenarios such as this uh, is that they will file uh, under a UCC in both jurisdictions. Uh, now again, uh, that gets back to the, cr the creation of the trust document. If the trust document was created uh, in, say, the state of Indiana, and, and therefore you have a choice of law, questions and all those things, uh, one would always argue or articulate that that is the home jurisdiction. But because we live in this land where we'd rather just have that belt and suspenders, in a scenario such as this, you see a you do see a number of people filing in both jurisdictions just to cover their bases. And again, it's fine. The, the, both states are going to take those filings. Uh, but again, in some cases, really the nuts and bolts of it are going to be in that trust document. Where was it created? All those types of factors, which we don't have in this fact scenario. Okay. Uh, scenario number six. The trustee is a registered organization. The trust has a name. Pretty straightforward. Name of trust, address the trustee, check the box, file where the trustee is registered. And again, I apologize for some of these slides being so uh, repetitious, 
but we just want to make sure that we kind of cover these as, as many as we can. Which gets us to question number three. All right, well, question three. Can a trust be nameless? Can a trust be nameless? No. Yes, if it meets certain state requirements. Yes, without any exception. Or yes, if approved by the coronavirus. Four and question three. Can a trust be nameless? No. Yes, if it meets certain state requirements. Yes, without any exception. Or yes, if approved by the coronavirus. Please make sure you answer your PLA polling questions on the pop-up that's appearing on your screen, not in the Q&A box. Also, really quick while we're waiting for those votes to come in, just to let me know if you're looking for today's presentation, it is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen under the files icon, or also in the reminder notices that was sent out this morning. Just give it just a few more seconds here. For question three, can a trust be mainline? No, it cannot be named. Yes, if it meets certain state requirements. Yes, without any exception. Yes, if approved by the coronavirus. All right, we're going to go ahead and close out the poll here and push the results over to Dan. Thank you, Amanda. Well, for the person who said yes, if approved by the coronavirus, I salute you. Uh, I was on the brown line coming down here today, and as many people as I heard sniffling and sneezing, uh, it was enough to, to, to think to myself, like, I better get one of these masks. Uh, no, 24.4, yes, if it meets certain state requirements. Yes, without any exceptions, 55.4. For those of you guys, you are the winners. It's, again, it can be, there are no requirements. You can be nameless, faceless, and all that jazz. The state doesn't care. Uh, if you want to, do that. Now, again, uh, just because the state doesn't have any rules around that doesn't mean that you want to have it nameless because, again, then you fall back into that naming the grantor or the settler uh, as on the UCC, which somewhat defeats the purpose of setting up the trust. But, again, there is no law out there that says you must name your trust. Absolutely not. So uh, uh, thank you for those of you who answered that question. Uh, this is also one of those things where uh, for the next trust presentation, I'll do a better job of, of, of uh, going into some specificity on that so that we, so we, we have a little bit more clarity on that. But yes, yes without any excep exceptions. Absolutely correct. All right. And so scenario number seven. All right. The trust is an organization not registered. The trust has a name, UCC1, name of trust, address of trustee, check the box. Again, that, I think it's just, and I sound almost like a parrot, uh, file where the trustee is located. Place of business at more than one place, location or chief executive office. Right. Uh, trust scenario, or excuse me, scenario number eight, debtor is a trustee. Trustee is an individual. The settler is an individual. Trust is without a name. So this is about as simple or straightforward as the old traditional like family trust without, you know, just right out, ripped right out of some sort of uh, turn of the century type or turn of the 20th century kind of book. Uh, UCC1, name of settler, address of trustee, check the box to indicate trustee or to indicate it's a trust, file where the trustee is located, trustee's principal residence. So this is, this, like I said, this is like something out of almost like Little House on the Prairie. S scenario number nine, debtor is a trustee, trustee is an individual, the settler is an organization, trust is without a name. Again, straightforward, name a settler, address a trustee, check the box, file where the trustee is located, trustee's principal residence. And again, my, I guess I probably, it bears mentioning at this point, though it's, it's probably self-explanatory, but it does bear mentioning, much like corporations and, every, and anything with a UCC, uh, even though we did have that one example with Indiana and Colorado, you only do have to file one UCC. I mean, the rules are pretty straightforward as it applies to trusts, as it applies to corporations. This isn't the day where you had to blanket the country or paper the country with a bunch of, of trust filings. 
uh, if again for a UCC purpose and for trust purposes, one UCC filing for the trust is sufficient. You don't have to, like I said, go out and get uh, too crazy with your with your UCC filings. Uh, trust scenario number ten: debtor as a trustee. The trustee is a registered organization. Settler is an organization. Trust is without a name. So again, this is the nameless trust. Name a settler, address a trustee, check the box, file with a trustee is registered. So, okay. And as we go to scenario number 11, uh, the trustee is a registered organization. Settler is an organization. Trust is without a name. Now we're getting into some very, very unique set of circumstances. But again, name a settler, address a trustee, check the box, file with a trustee, is registered. Uh, scenario 12, trustee is an organization, it's not registered. The settler is an individual. The trust is without a name. So now this is, again, we're back into a very vague gray area. Where, and again, we don't see that as frequently as we once did. But name a settler, address a trustee, check the box, File where the trustee is located, principal place of business, location of the chief executive office. Right? And we do have case law on uh, the, where the trustee is located. So if people do have some questions around that. There are some UCC cases out there um, that go into some detail as to how you define that location. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a case out in, I think, memory serves me correctly, it's out in New Jersey or New York. That, that talks about that with some with, with great detail. So if that's something that's making you scratch your head and you want some information, certainly let us know and we will make sure that we get that to you. All right. Scenario 13. Trust is an organization which is not registered. Settler is an organization. The trust is without a name. Again, we can see this pretty straightforward. Name a settler, address a trustee, check the box to indicate trustee. So again, these are sounding, I know, very repetitious, and I apologize for that. But again, there are some nuances in each one of these that you want to keep abreast of. Which gets us, fortunately for some, uh, is we have a trust example here that hopefully will break up some of the monotony. Delaware Statutory Trust has, has a related fund series. The funds are not statutory entities. However, they hold assets. The fund's assets are the collateral for a loan. In reviewing the file, you discover some UCCs that show the debtor is named the statutory trust name acting on behalf of the account. And again, there exists some documents between the bank firm to show this language. What is the proper name to use? What about the related fund series? Good question. It really is. And again, it kind of gets back to what I had originally, which I brought up a few slides ago, is that what is the name of the trust? And if the trust is XYZ trust, right? then that's the name that you use on the, on the filing. The series that's underneath of it, the related fund series, has nothing to do with the trust name. And in fact, this is one of the examples that came out of Kansas City. But someone listed, lifted that fund series up into the trust name. You can't do that. You really just can't do that. You're asking for yourself for a world of hurt when it comes to your UCC filing because that is not the name of the trust. Even though they're related, even though they're linked, even though that there's a lot of financial obligations that flow in between the, these two different entities that, that is separate and distinct from the UCC. And again, that's why you always want to drive that point home. When it comes to, this, when it comes to these matters, we have to make sure that, um, there's a, that there's the UCC law that you're following, and then there's trust law and the obligations under the agreement, but that's an entirely different creature. Moving on, oh. hyper three some thoughts. We already have uh, running out a little bit out of time, so I'll just jump to that. Searching. And we'll run through this fairly quickly, guys. A method to uncover all existing liens against the potential, against the liability of a particular debtor. Searches that can be included, as you can see, all these can all be searched under for the uh, for an individual as well as trust. Okay. Uh, again, same here. You know, we're pretty straightforward with all this jazz. Um, debtor names, state where the debtor is located, more than one way to search. What we do see people do, like with, with just like they do with their corporate um, 
names. You can search broad for your trusts. So again, if we're using the Beverly Odom Living Trust, you want to search the exact name of the trust? You certainly can. No problem against that. That's, per that's perfectly fine. But uh, you may have some things that fall outside the scope of revised Article 9 that could attach to that trust. And so what, what you see most folks do when it comes to searching for their trust, they use the broad-based approach when it comes to uh, their trust, just like they do the corporations. So you would use maybe Beverly Odom asterisk or star or what have you, and then you would, in cap, you would capture as much information as you possibly can, and then you would conduct your due diligence internally to determine what is connected to the trust, what's not connected to the trust, and go forward from there. So it is, again, on the search side, just like the filing side, it's very similar. You cast, you cast your net as wide as you possibly can to make sure that uh, you get all the data that's relevant for that decision. And last but not least, the one thing I'll plug here is the search to reflect. And again, just like you would do with a corporation, you want to make sure that your filing is correct. You go online, uh, go through the system after, after the through date, make sure that your filing is, is, is on there correctly. As we like to say internally, that's just cheap insurance and something that we would recommend. So as you can see from our wrap-up, trust basics, filing and searching, I hope that this information uh, was fairly straightforward and we didn't get you too confused or befuddled. I do know that we have uh, about 60 plus, uh, almost 70 questions. We'll certainly do our best to get those questions answered for you here in a timely fashion. Uh, but with that, I do appreciate the time uh, that you've given me today. And I'll be turning this over now to Amanda because I know she has some follow-up and finalized questions. So with Amanda, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Dan, and great presentation today. Just a really quick reminder, if you're seeking CLE, we have uh, four more questions that you'll need to answer back-to-back. -back. Um, CLE evaluation question one, please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And while we're waiting for those responses to come through, um, once you have successfully reached um, your full 60 minutes attending and answered all the CLE polling questions, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, your claim certificate will turn green. You'll be able to claim that certificate there. If you do get a spinning circle, it's just because several people are trying to claim at one time. You might have to log off and log back on at a later time. You can even, even do that on a different day as well. All right, we're going to go ahead and close out this poll. And then CLE evaluation question number two, please rate today's presenter on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Please rate today's instructor presenter on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And for those of you that are looking for today's presentation, that handout can also be located in the files icon, which is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, or also in the reminder notice that was sent out this morning. Daily evaluation question two, please rate today's presenter on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And we'll give you guys just a few more seconds here to wrap up your vote on question number two. All right, we're going to close the poll and move on to question three. And the next question is, please rate today's written materials on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Please rate today's written material on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. One more time here. Please rate today's written material on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest.
And as we wait for those responses to come in real quickly, just a reminder, uh, like Dan said, we did have several questions that came in today. Um, we will make sure that he gets those in a timely manner and is able to get those answered. And those, all the questions and answers will go out to all the individuals. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull or close that poll. And our last DLE question, please rate today's webinar technology on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Please also remember in the state of New York, California, and Illinois, your certificate will be manually sent to you via email uh, within 30 business days. Please note those are not um, computer generated. Those of you that have completed all the requirements today, answered all the CLE questions, which this one was the last one, and you've logged on for the full 60 minutes, you'll be able to receive your certificate. In the event that you're not able to stay on and download that certificate, because we are at the 2 o'clock mark, you can go ahead and log off and log back on at a later time to claim that. Please note our CLE course is only granted on live events. Today's event did take place on March 3rd, 2020. Thank you so much, and on behalf of Walters Clore and CT Corporation, we thank you for your valuable time in attending our webinars. Thank you, and have a great day.